Hi, Martin Brown. Uh, first thing you do uh, when you walk on your set is meet everybody, right? And uh, I have a rule on my set that we try and keep our phones hidden. And here we're going to have no phones just because it's a lot easier. You're going to have a video of me. You can listen to me pontificate for weeks on end if you need to. So what are we going to talk about today? We're going to talk about lighting. Um, and uh, just to give you a little background, I went to UNC, graduated in 82, um, have worked as a, a cameraman, director, photography, director, and producer in uh, Raleigh-Durham area predominantly, uh, but I've done a ton of documentary work, mostly for Discovery, uh, Animal Planet, Learning Channel, uh, Nat Geo, BBC, uh, shot a couple of films, um, and just boatloads of all kinds of other stuff, whether it's broadcast or corporate or commercial work. That's that's what I've done. Lived in Hillsboro uh, since I graduated from Carolina, and uh, I have two children, and they both went to school here. So that's part of why you get to have me come in and talk to you. Um, so um, that's a little of my background. Um, Fortunately, I'm talking about something that has not changed at all since I went to school. Lighting is the same. The tools have changed, but the concepts are all the same. Same stuff I learned in school, so we're just going to go through a lot of, um, in this session, a lot of stuff about the basics of light, how light works, for lack of a better way of saying it. And then uh, in the later sessions, which we're filming, y'all can come back and watch and look at more specific techniques, how they're applied, um, and how things happen uh, on set a little bit, okay? We're not gonna be able to dig too deeply into things, but we'll be able to talk um, uh, in general terms about stuff. Um, and the goal being, uh, Mr. Gett said that the goal was to have a, teach everyone how to do a nice three-point lighting setup for an interview, so that's the, that's the full goal of the day. But I wanted to start with what you need to know about lighting so you can think big or small or different or dramatic or bland, you know, you can have the whole arc of things. And you can start to see um, um, light in a new way because it's one of your best tools in, what, in telling a story, okay? So types of light, uh, types of light, I call it daylight. Um, what's our pri it's a simple question. What's the primary source of light on the planet? The sun, right? That's not news. But how many kinds of daylight are there? All th how many? Three. It's a good guess. I might go with more, but that's okay. So we'll start with direct sunlight, right? Boom, hitting you, nice big shadow, wearing your sunglasses, hard on your eyes. Okay, then what, overcast? Right? So like sort of softer shadows, et cetera. We've all experienced that. Um, the kind of sunlight I hate the most, which is broken up where clouds are coming in and out and it's bright and it's cloudy, it's bright and it's cloudy. Very hard to work in from a, my point of view. Uh, but there's a lot of other things. So uh, a northern window. So if you've ever been in a room in a house or I bet if you walk around the school building, you will find windows that face the north. And the light coming in is always nice and soft. There's never any direct light coming in through that window. Uh, if you look at painters uh, from the Renaissance and earlier, they used northern windows, because that's what they had, to produce nice, soft, shadowless light on people so that they could work. So uh, if you hit an art history class, you'll learn the same thing. So daylight comes in a lot of flavors, okay? And then we think about tungsten. Well, we have what we have in here, right? These noisy, buzzy fluorescents, right? That's one. They're called, in my business, flows, because we're lazy. Um, and uh, a lot of times when we, I walk into a room like this, I just do that, because <laughs> it's so unattractive. It's just awful to work with. In fact, everyone in this room looks better with those lights off. I just want you to know that. I probably don't. Actually, I might, I'm the oldest person here, so I might look better with less light. But we'll get into that later. Um, tungsten, anybody know what that is? That's what these lights are. Uh, tungsten is what Thomas Edison invented. 
okay, the original light bulb. A metal wire inside a glass bulb with a vacuum, etc. cetera. Uh, and then you all know about LEDs, right? Uh, anything else? Oh, come on, there's some easy ones. We all like to sit around fires. Anyone had a candlelight dinner? Um, anything else? How about light underwater? This is great. I love this picture. I, you put it here for me, didn't you? Yes. Yeah, because mm -hmm. underwater lighting is a really specific uh, technique in art, and because water changes light a lot, okay? Um, but that's just another example. And if you think about it, light bouncing off of water, right? You get those, where else do you get these upward sharp reflections of light that bounce up on people? Um, we often do a trick where we'll try and make people be by a lakeside, but we don't want, we don't want to stand in the water with the cameras. So we move them back eight or 10 feet, we put a big pan of water out in front of them, fill it up with a half inch of water, Somebody sits there and <laughs> bounces the water a little bit and reflects up on them. You can't tell. We're on dry land. Okay. So there are a lot of ways to manipulate light to help you. You're not going to learn any of the good stuff, but there are a lot of ways to manipulate light to produce it. And you have to be able to think about what each of these things look like before you try and create it, right? So if you look at the lights at the football stadium, what do they look like? Compare them to daylight. Anyone got any thoughts on that? They're kind of bright and harsh and direct. Okay. What color are they? Just white. Super white. Almost too white, right? Okay. Any, anyone else? How about street lights? Like in, uh, I'm trying to think of a part of town that's got them. What I, we call them sodium, sodium vapors, like they're orangey and kind of got a big green spike in them, right? Okay, you know what I'm talking about? So all these different things, uh, street lights... Um, so the lights at the football stadium are probably uh, uh, halide. This is kind of a halide type of light. There's there are a slew of different commercial lighting things out there. And as a camera person or director of photography, you walk into all these settings, and it's like, oh, I'm shooting a football stadium. I'm shooting a game. It's a scene on the field where two people are talking about X, Y, Z. Well, the best thing you can do to make it feel like it's real is make that setting right. So you have to think about what do I have, what don't I have, how much time do I have, how much money don't I have or do I have, etc. And all these things add into that. And so lighting and the creation of the feel of that reality, because if you, have you ever walked into a room and gone, this doesn't feel right to me? It feels bizarre, and a lot of times it's because the lighting doesn't feel like it should be in this space. Like uh, really modern movies that have really modern looks, um, the Marvel comic stuff, they all have this sort of otherworldly lighting effect. Uh, I haven't seen Aquaman, but I've only seen the trailer for it. But you know, in Aquaman, there's all this up light, bouncy, reflective up light going on. What do you think? They figured that out, you know. Um, so. If you watch films, documentaries, interviews, you'll see this whole arc of how people use light to tell stories. And that comes from what type of light do you expect to see there, okay? Um, and then the better part is what type of light do you want people to see there? In other words, now you're manipulating your viewer to believe the reality you're creating for them. Um, and this is a key this is key, because not only with light do you create the feeling, but you focus their eye, their attention to a spot, whether it's the actor's face or the other actor's face or something off in the distance or what's in his hand, etc. So lighting has a very subtle way of manipulation and pointing the viewer's eyes towards things. And it's, there's a part of human vision that it will look at the brightest thing in any scene. So if you, and you can experiment with yourself, just pull some stuff up on the screen 
and watch it and try and go, where does my eye go first? Where does my eye go first? What does it go to, right? And you'll start to realize, oh, I always look at that bright highlight in the background when I look at the, now your, your attention may turn to something else in the video, but you'll notice that your, your eye not directed by your brain goes to the brightest thing. After that, it goes to motion, okay? These are all survival instincts that you cannot unprogram. Uh, so why do actors move in frame? Why do cameras move? Because that's where our eyes go. So we're focusing attention. That's the camera talk. But with lighting, brightest thing in the scene. So when you look at an interview, what's bright? The person's face, right? The background's just slightly less bright somehow so that you always are focusing on their eyes, on, what, on what, how they're telling their story, whether it's with their hands or facial emotion, et cetera. So that's, we're manipulating people, hopefully in a positive way, but we're still doing it. So types of light. Now, there are different ways to understand how light um, is. Well, it, it, it's, it, so you've probably, has anyone taken like physical science? You've heard light's a wave, light's a particle. Some of that, you've gotten some of that, right? Okay. So uh, we're not dealing with it at the physics level so much. We're dealing with it at, although some of this is kind of low level physics stuff, uh, but it's broken down and simpler because we are dealing with it in the visual spectrum. So everyone knows, everyone, everyone's seen a rainbow? Yeah, we're dealing only with visible light, okay? So Roy G. Biv, red, da, 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 da. everyone know, does everyone know Roy G., the, the acronym Roy G. Biv? Wow, thing I, something I know. So Roy G. Biv, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet. That's the spectrum. That's the color spectrum, right? So then you have, uh, what's the one below red? Uh, indigo? No, 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 uh, it's a... Infrared, yeah, it's a heat. IR is down here. You guys have IR cameras now. Like, there are IR cameras you can buy. And then you have UV up here, which we can't see. We can feel these. Okay? Um, that's, this is what makes you want to put on sunglasses. Because it's hard on your eyes. And this is what causes you to get a sunburn. <laughs> <laughs> and this is what, when you walk by the heat lamp, uh, heating food at a, a buffet or something, that's, that's it, that's IR. So, But red, the spectrum of light, is what we see in the rainbow. And what we work with on a camera, or f whether it's digital or film or whatever, is this full spectrum of visible light, okay? Um, <clears throat> and that's described as color temperature. So, um, do the cameras have 32K and yes. 56K? Okay, yes. so 32K, right, to 56K uh, is a spectrum. Sorry about the writing. Um, 32K is the color temperature of tungsten light. So I'll just flip this on for you. So if we compare this on the floor to these up here, can y'all see a difference in them? little bit, uh, these look a little bit bluer to me. That's just my eye, okay? And I don't have any daylight sources in here, but if, we, oh, actually, I do have a daylight source. Um, I can, I can turn no, I found one. I, I fixed your light for oh. you. <laughs> um, and this light has got uh, fluorescent bulbs in it, but they're daylight bulbs. So they're probably, they say they're 56 Kelvin. I don't believe that. Um, I think they're probably like 5,000. Um, yeah, there we go. So I'll turn that off. So that's nice and blue. Let me turn this guy on over here. Now you can really see the difference, right? Yep. See how warm, sorry about that on your eyes, guys. Let me do a little. So that's a fairly decent description of color temperature. Um, if I remove this bag off the front of this, you'd get more output, but it's just, I, what I want you to see is that this is warmer, for lack of a better way of saying it, and this is 
bluer. We, from a lighting guy perspective, that's warm light, cool light. Doesn't have anything more to do with it. And then if I throw these on, it, it's yeah. somewhere in the middle, right? And actually, if you look real close, particularly over right over here, I see it real well. That see how green that gets all of a sudden? Uh -huh. Like off. Just watch. Just watch that spot. Bam. See it? Everything turns greener. These lights. Now compare. Feel like feel the green spike come in. Does anyone else see it, or is it just me? No. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> you can see it. Okay. So. Um, your best tool in lighting is your eye, and so training yourself. Yeah, and you're right. Some of it could be bounce off of that for sure, because colors in the room affect stuff. Um, but fluorescent lights have um, a green spike in them. So an important thing to think about is that not all lights are flat across the spectrum. Okay, um, some lights have a spike. And this light, I actually think that light's worse than this light, has a little more green in it. So if you were to if you were to use a particular tool, you'd actually be able to see, you know, a spot where it would jump up in the green spectrum. Important because um, green doesn't look good on people. Green green people, uh, you think they're sick or from a different planet. Okay, that's just, uh, and that's actually. Again, another one of those built-in things. Um, if anyone's ever seen a baby that's uh, got s their their um, liver is just getting started, right? This is a pretty common thing. They're green. Their skin is green, and people who get real sick at their stomach can turn turn green. You ever hear that expression? So it's a uh, it's an often used trick in the movie business. If people look green, you're like, mm, that's not so good. What's going on with that person, right? So. Um, so, but this, from, from a lighting perspective, you end up working with lighting sources and you have to figure out how to sort it out. With a camera like this, in this lighting, you'd hit white balance. The camera will magically make that go away. You'll have nice flat light because the camera can do stuff your eyes can't do. But your eyes can do things the camera can't do. So one thing that I was trying to point out to you with the little experiment on the floor of warm light daylight and then pop in this fluorescent is to see the differences in the light. Um, I can remember when I finally routinely saw differences in color temperature. Now my wife is annoyed with me because I walk around, I'll walk into a room and I go, oh, this room is awful, I hate, mm, it's <laughs> awful. Uh, and she goes, you do that everywhere. It's like, yeah, it's because I can't not see it now. Okay, but. Um, it's a normal, normal people uh, walk around and they don't perceive it. They just go from place to place and the human eye is very good at adapting to color. The camera is very bad at it. The camera wants either to be at 56 or 32 or hit the white balance button. It doesn't like any, anything in between because it doesn't have the flexibility that our brains and eyes have together to go, I know your skin color should be this way, and uh, uh, etc. And so it balance, you know, it does. I do an automatic white balance in my head, right? So just one of those subtle things. Okay, so when we think about light, I walk into a setting and I go, how am I going to light it, and what color temperature am I going to work in, right? So um, in this room, as we play today, we're going to work in 32. Okay, because we're inside, there's no daylight sources coming in. I can hit that button, turn off these overheads, and work with the lights that I have and create the look that I want to look, do. Okay, um, with uh, a room that maybe had a window in it, let's say I'm doing a documentary interview for 60 minutes, I've done this 100 times, um, and I'm in somebody's office in New York City, and the best looking thing in this incredibly small office is looking out the window. So you have to make a compositional choice. How am I going to set the uh, correspondent and the interview subject together? How are we going to do that? What are we going to do, etc. And uh, okay, great. So I'm committed to being in day working in daylight.
with that shot because I don't care how much light I bring into the room, I'm never going to be stronger than the big light in the sky. It's always going to win the battle forever. So either you work with it or you end up with results you don't like. Uh, so, um, so, so that that brightest source in a room is something you can uh, that you must think about and choose. And usually that dictates what color temperature you're going to work in. So if I was in your uh, room out here where you're all editing, and I just wanted to shoot a lot of B-roll of students on computers editing and having conversation and mapping out their their stuff, I'd probably walk into that room white balance and just start filming and let the lights, the little differences in color temperature between spaces just get sorted because it's all blending. That's just, you know, you look at that space out there, it's one big flat fluorescent bank. Uh, I might then, if I decided I needed to do an interview in that space, take a light like that, okay, drop a little bit of gels in front of it. These allow me to adjust the color temperature of lights. It's another class, but we're going to talk about it real quickly here. And then bring that light to match that predominant source out there. Okay? And, um, and uh, with LED, modern LED lights, you have a dial on the back. You just go, well, it's, you can bring it, make it warmer, cooler, etc. So you have a lot of flexibility with new tools that I didn't have five years ago. Stuff didn't exist. But same thinking, 32K, 56K, or somewhere in between. Now, interestingly, there is a lot of visible light that's out past this. Um, uh, any of you guys watch that Viking series that was on a couple of years ago? I'm trying to think the name of it. Real violent. Um, your parents would never have let you watch it. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. Uh, but uh, they shot a lot of stuff in Twilight because they're these. I can't think of the name of the series. Do you know it? Uh, no. Nah. But they shoot a lot of stuff in Twilight because they're, you know, theoretically this is set in a northern environment, uh, and so they have these long twilight hours where the sun's not, you know, floating along the horizon. So you have this kind of uh, mystical light feeling. Uh, it's dramatic but it's still got a lot of open sky. Um, so if you think about um, uh, skylight as opposed to sunlight, skylight's often as high as 10,000 Kelvin. So it looks really blue, uh, almost you know, twice as blue as this, uh, 10K over here as skylight, uh, as just as a guess. And that's got some neat... Uh, possibilities uh, if you play with it. So you would set your camera here, but let the image look really blue and bleak and wintry. And so there's a lot of ways that you can play with this. So if you pick a spot and then you add, and we'll, uh, we'll try and play a little bit with some of this, uh, we'll see some differences as we go along. Uh, okay, uh, enough about color temperature because there's you, this can go on forever. Uh, hard versus soft, and this is um, uh, a discussion of the nature of the light. Okay, versus it's it's um, how uh, how direct the light is and how harsh the shadows are. Okay, so for this, I'm going to need one volunteer to sit in the middle of the room. Who wants to be the volunteer? <laughs> So just drag your chair out. We'll apologize for the light being in your face. I'm going to make you face that camera because that makes life so much easier. Okay, and we're going to start with, and in fact, come even closer to me. Um, yeah, keep on coming because the closer you are to this wall, the easier life will be for the cameraman. Okay, so, and you may not want to look right at this light. So this is going to be bright. Actually, there's a, you can sit on the couch anyway. Uh, oh, this room. Okay, you ready? Yeah. Tell me your name again. Jose. Jose, watch out, this is bright. I'm serious. <laughs> okay, yes, I wasn't lying, was I, Jose? 
we're going to save Jose's eyes just a little bit and uh, drop some wire in here that'll make that a little less intense. So what do we see uh, for folks over here who can't really see his face that well on this side, but if you look at his face, he's got a really sharp nose shadow and a sharp shadow here, right? It's like super intense, sunlight-esque, right? But it does some other really cool stuff, like he's got that great eye light sparkle, which only hard light will give you. And um, so let's think about that for a second and see how that looks, okay? And there's a couple of things about that that we'll get into later, and this gets into light placement and stuff. But we'll turn that off. Did you get what, that shot you needed? Okay. And do me a favor, Jose, while you're there. We'll get you to plug this light in behind you. And this is one of your lights. And this is a soft light. So essentially what's... It's okay. We're going to we're going to stand on it all day. Okay, now let's look at this light. What does that look like on Jose's face compared to the other one? Come on guys, speak up. Don't be shy. Yes, what does it look like there's there's no no it's like don't worry about being less low. sharp. Less sharp shadows, right? Yeah. Right. So, uh we describe it as hard, and what we're looking at now is soft, okay? And in a way that makes it, I mean, how can you think of light as being hard, right? What a bizarre, light's not, you can't even touch it. How can it be hard? But it's the, uh, the language that has built up around it. Um, and I'm going to turn that off, give his eyes a rest for a second. I see some other soft light on him, and that soft light's coming in from outside, right? Indirect, it's a big... That could be the sky out there. That could be a big window out there. Anything that's indirect, right, that's coming in and it's wrapping around. See how nice the shadow transmissions are real soft. And by shadow transmission, I mean the, the difference between... Um, there's two parts to a shadow, and I'm not going to get this right. Um, umbrum and penumbrum. And umbrum is the deep shadow and penumbrum is the part around it. You'll hear people talk about this during eclipses and stuff, right? But the sharpness of light um, affects that shadow. So the further away the light source is, the sharper the shadow will be, which is why the sun gives you these awesome, really sharp shadows, right? You can't get it with anything else almost. And because um, the sun's really far away, but it's also incredibly powerful. Uh, but you can emulate it. You can get real close to it with movie tools. So, so we're going to put the soft light back on, and we're going to play with some things here for a second. So with a soft light and this transmission, slide this over towards you. Take it, push it way over in that corner for a second. So, okay. So I can go real sidey with this. I would never put it that close to him really in real life. I would back it up, but we don't have enough space. So, um, see, it's I can still see both his eyes, even with the light way around on the side and up high like that, right? Uh, so that is a very dramatic, that could be a very dramatic way of, and he's kind of isolated, because before when the light was out in front, it was lighting up the background too. But now I can control a little bit of what's going on around him. So a soft light gives you some power to produce different sort of looks, but it, they have to be, it has to be controlled because it goes all over. Soft light just goes everywhere, right? Whereas a hard light's real easy to shape, and we'll show that in a second. Um, so we got it here. I'm going to bring it out here. And Jose, thanks for being a good sport. <laughs> so right here, if we look at that on the camera, it's really flat. There is no ratio, is there? There's no shadow on his face, even side to side, okay? And I don't know about y'all, but um, that's kind of boring, you know? It's okay, nothing wrong with it, but it doesn't... If I look at what it's doing with where am I looking, I'm still looking at him but it doesn't add, it doesn't tell much of the story. Now, sometimes you want 
bland lighting. It is okay to have bland lighting if that's the goal, but I tend towards something that's a little more modeled, like so, round about there. Yeah, and there's a couple, I know this is, sorry, this is not about you, it's all about the lights, but I know you're gonna feel like, geez, this guy's like all up in my space. <laughs> so Jose, if you're looking here, right here, right? Okay, so check out the shadow under him here and right here on his nose. See, I told you it's gonna be all up in your space. <laughs> so um, if you take, if you, if you look at uh, some old paintings, Go, go find an art history book and look at some of the Dutch painters, uh, particularly um, the Renaissance people. You will see that they always tuck the nose shadow okay, into this little fold right here on your cheek. It's a very attractive way to make people look. It's kind of like it forms the face in a nice... They did all this work. They, there's, there's more art history reading about this than I can ever tell you, but it's a fascinating thing. It also does some nice things. It tends to, um, everyone has space here, it gets worse as you get old, and having the light up a little higher, about 30 degrees up and 30 degrees off, not only tucks that in, but it also shadows down here, and so that tends to refine the focus on the face, okay? So that's that. Jose, you're a good sport. <laughs> Uh, okay, so now we're going to do the same thing and we're going to do it with a hard light because if we do it with a hard light, you're really going to see what it does, okay? And um, let me get this up about the same height. Watch your eyes, buddy. It's going to be hot. There we go. Okay. Now he looks like he's being interrogated by the police. Uh, <laughs> particularly with the nice shadow. See how nice I can take that light off the background with the door? Bam, right, like a lot of control, right? Um, so that light's about the same space. And if you look at the nose shadow, you really see the nose shadow tucked in. I'm gonna put it exactly where the, the Dutch masters would have stuck it. I hope, I'll try. It's usually about 30 to 40 degrees off the camera. And yeah, that's it. So see his nose shadow tucked right into this little cleft that everyone has right here. You, you young folks have a much less refined cleft because you have these nice, bright, shiny faces that don't have all this going on, but a little age and it pops in there. And then the shadow underneath his chin and onto his shoulder, it's, it, it compresses, uh, it, it focuses your eye on the face in a way that's really nice. Um, so, and you can really see in the hard light how lovely his eyes sparkle. They just, you know, all the life that's in people's eyes really pops out. That's one thing, a lot of times you'll see uh, shooters take a big source like this and then take a very little light like the one that's behind him and put it in the middle so that you have a mix of hard and soft light so you get the, the best of both worlds, okay? Um, and you can see how dark the shadow is on him right here, and I'll even do it so he can see it. So right on him, I get a nice, tight, hard shadow, right? Can everybody see my fingers, shadows on him? Now if I come out here and I do the same thing, what happens? Much more diffuse, right? So, and you can see that change, getting sharper and sharper and sharper. So, um, there's some physics, I'm not gonna go into it, but talks about how far between the light source and the subject and how hard a cut you can get, which is why, I'm gonna do this one more time, which is why on this right here, I can get such a nice sharp cut on him on the backdrop, right? And if I was to come out even further with a big flag, I can go even further and further and further and shadow it off of him. So hard light gives you way more control than soft light. Uh, Soft light looks really nice on people. Thank you. You are a very good sport, Jose. Um, I'm gonna leave those sitting right there and let you go back. <laughs> okay. Any questions? Any thoughts? Question? Are you okay? Did I burn your eyes out? Yeah. No. 
I see a little bit of black. Yeah, you got you got the blue dot syndrome. Yeah, I hear you. That happens. Now, now you know what it feels like to be the talent. Yeah, right. You can appreciate what the talent's going to feel like on the other side of the light. And hard light's hard. As you experience, it's hard on you. It's, I mean, it's exhausting, right? There's an element of, of, of exhausting you. Think about it being a news correspondent waiting to do a live shot back to the network. And you're sitting there, and you're in front of whatever it is, and it's brightly lit. Okay? And so a guy like me has taken a big old light, and it's just pounding you with it so that they can see you well in front of whatever is behind you and you got to sit there and hi here I am you know with your eyes open you can't be squinting and so it's actually it's actually difficult to do it takes practice uh, and as a camera person it's nice to be kind to your talent when possible just like I said to you hey you may want to close your eyes or watch where you're looking this is going to be real bright, right? And no matter, even though I had the light kind of off to the side a little bit, if I bring that light right around and behind the camera, it's going to be like really hard to look at, okay? There's some other things you can do that make that easier. Looking into darkness is really hard. So like he was looking into a completely dark space. If I put another light behind the camera and light that up, then his eye, is instead of his iris being open, it closes down. And so... It's a little less hard on his eyes, just as a trick. Okay, um, so hard versus soft and shadows. More control with hard light. More ways to play with the drama of it. Does everyone know what I mean if I say the Frosted Flake ads? You know, the I like Frosted Flakes and you can't see the person talking. They're in shadow and the, there's light behind them. So that's a good use of hard light. So like you've got a bunch of light behind somebody, nothing on them and you, they're complete shadow, complete silhouette, uh, and then that light can move all the way around to be directly in front and be nice and flat at the end. So you have that whole world of placement as well as the nature of the light, okay? Um, and on this soft light, uh, I will show you, they have done, may have made an attempt to give some control to this light by putting this grid in here. Um, so if, if, and this grid should be removable, let's see, yeah, yeah, <laughs> is it on the outside? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Okay, so you can unvelcro this grid, right? We don't need to, it's fine. But because it's got, we call it an egg crate on it, right? The egg crate makes it, makes this big soft light which is more similar to that room than it is to this, okay? That's, a, that's an extremely soft and direct source. This light, pull the egg crate off, it's a big soft source. Put the grid on, it becomes a little more directional, right? It's like the, the light, if you can think of the light coming out in waves, instead of it just going and it goes everywhere, right? Which is the definition of soft, just kind of going everywhere. Um, it has some directionality to it. So you have these columns of wavy light as opposed to just a big swimmy flow. I know, I talk about light like it's a thing, isn't it? <laughs> it's, and, but, um, but that's the best way I can describe it to you. And the best way to learn about it is to play around a little bit. And, uh, and, and really, the modification of a single bulb, there are a thousand different tools to modify one bulb to make it look like all these different feelings we're trying to get. And that's kind of that's kind of the fun, cool part about lighting. That's what I like about lighting is that's like, oh, if I keep playing with it, I can, you know, achieve some other thing. So now we're going to jump into fixtures and um, Fixtures, which we're, we're crossing over to a little bit here. Is that in your, probably really badly in your shot? How about that? Is that better? Um, this is a fixture. Any light is a fixture. It's how, in the general term, we describe it. Um, this is a Fresnel, which means, let's make sure it's not too hot. Um, these get hot, by the way, uh, produce a lot of heat which means that this has a glass 
lens in it, okay? And it is, uh, the bare bulb is back here. If you guys want to get up and look, you're welcome to. Yeah. It's, Everybody take a look. Maybe the three of you look and then next um, yeah, so bulbs here, reflector, and then this lens. Let me make it short enough for everybody. I have to realize not everyone is my height. There you go. That is a big bulb. That's a 650. Come on, guys. And then you're able to move this bulb forward and backward, right? It changes the focus of it through the lens. Okay, so just like a lens, lens bulb reflector, just like a lens focuses light on the camera, come on, uh, it does the same thing in here. It's just, think about it, it's the other way around, right? It's reverse. So, uh, lens, bulb, reflector. Okay, and it's just on a little twisting thing. There's nothing fancy. This, these are actually the oldest lights I own. These lights are, this was my like first really good lighting purchase. They're Mm. <laughs> None of you are as old as these lights. <laughs> How's that? That's, that? That's a good uh, um, advertisement for those. Lights. For those lights, exactly. The bulbs are old, are younger than you, but the light itself, uh, other than a few repairs, is is older than you. Uh, okay, so for now, and I'm going to flip this off again real quick, and we're going to use the ceiling this time because it'll be easier on everybody's eyes. Okay. So there you go. And you were asking a very good question about what does that do? That So you see how it's flooding out. We call that flood. We call that spot. And if you go, if you do any theater stuff, same idea. So you can spot the light in or flood it out. And this has a modest effect on, on the shadows. So pick somebody in the room. Let's see if we can look at one of your neighbors. And you can see... I can see underneath everyone's eyes, right? When I spot it, it gets a little more shadowy. And when I flood it out, it opens up a little bit. Very subtle, but it is happening. Now, off for a second, because I want to save my eyes. If I haven't told you, your eyes are your best tool. Do be kind to them. Wear sunglasses when you're working if you need to. Um, these are called barn doors. Okay, uh, same idea as that grid on the, uh, I'm not 20 anymore. Uh, they slip right on in front and they allow you to control this, right? So you can see I can get a box, but I can control the shape of the box a little bit, right? Is that beaming that camera? Sorry about that. Uh, or I can open up a door, open up a bottom door, all kinds of different shapes. Uh, and in fact, there's more complex stuff that can happen. Uh, these are called scrims. They're just wire. It's a double. So it takes out a stop of light. That's a single. Takes out a half a stop of light. We'll talk more about that in class three, I think, maybe two. Um, but that's a way of controlling, okay? So, yeah, feel free. Here, pass them around. You can't break them. Well, you could, but you'd have to work really hard. Um, so, barn doors, shaping, right? These wire scrims, right, are a way of, so of uh, sending the light through without really changing its nature. So the light stays hard and sharp, but you're essentially putting something in front of it and cutting down how much can go through, okay? Um, this little small Fresnel, same thing, and there's little teeny scrims in here. Uh, what is the nickname for that light? Oh, uh, you're thinking of inkies and all that stuff. Uh -huh. That yeah, that well, technically that's only a, a Mole Richardson light, but okay. but yeah, they people call it an inky. And then this light, this Reefa light, which let's see if I can easily get inside. I can. Okay, that light has that same bulb that's in the, these areas. Same type of bulb, it's a tungsten bulb, okay? Nothing fancy. The, if you if you actually just study the shape of this fixture and stuff, you'd see that it's the same as the shape of the bulbs in those fixtures. But a much bigger device, right, to create 
a big reflective box to make light soft. Okay, um, and 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 this falls into the the thinking around fixtures too, right? So. These are all just tools of the trade that people have developed over literally hundreds of years, starting with photography. Uh, and even some of this was done in, when people were still just painting. Okay, They would create sources. Uh, even though there was no, um, no artificial light at that time. Uh, candles, okay. Candles and firelight. But I still consider I consider that a natural form as opposed to something you can generate with electricity. Okay, so um, these are all the same bulb, but you get, as you can see, different types of light out of this, right? Um, so the Fresnel is the important. I sh this bulb was just a bare bulb sitting in there, right? That would be an if you took this stuff off, that would be an open face. The face of the light is open. This is a Fresnel, so it's got a lens in it. Um, there are some other things that exist, but these are the two primaries, open-faced and then with a lens in front. Uh, HMIs, um, it's a type, different way of making light, um, different uh, electronics behind it. It makes daylight, okay? So it makes 56K light. These guys all make 32K light. Tungsten, universally 32K, or around there. Sometimes a little lower, a little higher. LED lights, you all probably know more about them than I do. Um, they can make daylight, they can make tungsten light, they can make color temperatures in between. The thing about LED is that uh, even though they're little, tend to be small little bulbs, right? Right? They And they stack 500 or 1,000 on a card to create a fixture. I didn't bring mine in today. Um, if you think about 10 or 1,000 little bulbs, you get 1,000 little shadows, okay? Unlike this light, which is one shadow. So if you, there are times where LED lights produce, they're super handy, they're low power consumption, they're lightweight, they fit in a car really well, you know, there's a hundred good things about LED lights, and there's a couple of things about them that I don't like. They make a thousand little shadows. If you have a thousand little bulbs, you get a thousand little shadows. So you're almost always obliged to put some sort of soft diffusion in front of them to make them not so... Because um, you can see it. I mean, uh, you may not notice it. It may take a while for you to train yourself to see it, but if you're looking at the light, you're going, wow. That shadow doesn't look right, and then suddenly you're like, oh, it's an LED light. No wonder it's a thousand little shadows. The shadow doesn't have a nice clean break like, like your brain thinks shadows should have a good clean break. Okay. Uh, we talked about tungsten. We talked about a soft box. Now, silks and butterflies and bounce. Uh, we'll come to bounce in a second. Silks and butterflies, I didn't bring in an example today. They are fabrics. Um, and they are used predominantly outside. Uh, the sun's a very strong source, uh, and sometimes you want to have a, you want to moderate that source. Um, so if you think about silk fabric, right, and how light would transmit through that, that softens it up. It diffuses it just like this soft fabric up here does, just like We'll put this on this tungsten light in a second. Just like this piece of gel does, it confuses the light and makes it less sharp. And that um, uh, that allows you to essentially create a shadow between the sun and your subject so that your subject is now lit by this softened up light from the sun and it's more attractive on people. Okay? It's just a simple trick. In the movie world, they use stuff called butterflies. Some people call them overheads. If you ever look, you guys, do you get American cinematographer here? Um, no. Okay. But we do have some different um, yeah, photo stuff. I'll, I, maybe I'll bring in my, some point when I see you, I'll bring you 10 old American cinematographers and oh, people can look at the pictures and read the articles. Yeah. So butterflies are essentially cranes, okay? Big uh, 40 by 40 foot wide frames hung from a crane 
uh, with the, uh, silk fabric on top of it or there's some other types of fabric. And again, the same idea. You're softening the light from the sun to create a space that uh, looks good on your actors. Okay, most That's mostly in movies, you know, television, big television series stuff. You're rarely going to do that here. But when I shoot an interview with somebody on a golf course, I almost always use a silk. And I almost always use the silk, pop it up on one stand, a couple of sandbags, everyone looks great. It's a fabulous thing. Okay, finally bounce. Pierre, there's a big white and black card right by the door. Do you see them tucked in there? Yeah, that's a flag. No, the one right behind yeah. And we're going to play around with these lights. Yeah, you can hand them both to me. Sure, why not? So the final thing we're going to talk about is bounce. And this is like the cheapest uh, cheapest lighting resource you can use, particularly handy outside. Yeah, just a piece of foam core, white on one side, black on the other. Uh, and you can tell these are well loved. Um, <laughs> or uh, well used. Okay, so we're going to do a couple things. I'm going to do this with this light. We're going to get rid of the fluorescence overhead for a second. So now that's a nice hard source, right? But if I take it and I bounce it, oh, can you hold that for me? Great, thank you. And I bounce it in here, right? And I make this bigger. Now the light on their face over there looks really nice and soft. Not a lot. Some shadows, a little bit of shadow behind people, right? Uh, I can see behind, I don't remember your name. Ethan. Ethan. Behind Ethan's head, there's a shadow on the white, right? And and the shadow's actually going up because this light's below him, right? Which is a little unusual. But um, if we moved it up. But it's a nice soft, and if you remember how the light looked on Jose's face when it was coming out of the soft box, nice soft source. An incredibly cheap way of getting soft light on your subject. And all it takes is a friend to hold it. It's a great thing. Um, now, let's do another thing. Slide that silver one. You guys hang on to that. Slide the silver one over here. And uh, that's this from Home Depot. Uh, <laughs> high tech. OK, now, yes, even you notice this brighter, eh? Right, and, and check that out. How much shadow can I get behind him? Uh, Pretty, pretty potent. I can focus and flood. And it's a real different feel, isn't it, on their faces. Uh, but yeah, I know. Sorry about that. So this is awesome outside. Um, it's just uh, insulation is all it is. So it, this is strong enough that inside, I'm going to show you. It's easier to show than it is to tell. Um, so stand up for me. Tell me your name. Robert. Hi, Robert Martin. Nice to meet you. So Robert's going to be my subject for a second. So everyone look at Robert's face. And if Robert's looking, let's look at, I can't say look at Duke because it goes against the grain. But if you look at the Duke guy over there. <laughs> see the see the eyeshadow? He's got like the, the eyeshadows that are typical of fluorescent lights. Everyone's got this like gloomy eyeshadow thing. Uh, you're shooting somebody at a computer, and they don't look real pretty because they have these eyeshadows from the gloomy overhead lights. Take something shiny and do that. Oh. Can everybody see what happens? Right? So any little thing that's shiny, bright and shiny like this, I'm sorry, you can't see it, but it brightens up the underside of your eyes and makes you look less... Um, like you're hating the fluorescent light because that's what I think when I look at people like that. So this is great outside. You, thank you, Robert. You may sit. Um, uh, great outside. If you want to put some light on somebody um, from an angle that's off the sun, okay? Like you want to give them some edge or you want to create, you want to highlight something or people are working in a shadowy area but you want to pump some light into it somehow couple of these guys, I mean, they cost, you know, it's like $10 at Home Depot, so it's nothing. And they basically last forever. Uh, and the foam core, any, you can find it in a lot of places. Now, there's the opposite of bounce. While we're here, we'll talk about this. Um, what time is it? 
I'm going to get 9.43. You guys, how long do I have you? What time do you use class in? Uh, this, this class gets over in uh, about 25 minutes. Awesome. Okay. So we have some time for questions. Okay, a uh, couple more things and then we'll talk <laughs> questions. Um, so this is a, could be a negative. Okay, so the opposite of bouncing light in would be how does one remove it, right? How do you make it go away? So just like you notice that the green from the thing was bouncing onto his face, right, and causing that green. So let's see, uh, Robert, why don't you look out that way, and everyone sees some light bouncing this side of Robert's face, right? So if I slide this in and negative him, does that take some of it out? Let's see if we can see. Yeah, it does, just yeah, a little bit. It it's very subtle. It's hard to do in here with this space. But if I'm in a spot where I'm lighting him, and there's a big white wall over here that's spewing a bunch of light back at him, I'll come and sneak a negative in somewhere over here to make it more dramatic. Another way I could do that, I bet, is to do, yeah, that really does it. So, so now I've covered up the light on top of him, and it's just those lights out there that are playing on him. And actually, probably, is that more attractive on him? Mm -hmm. Yeah? You guys think so? I know, you're laughing. It's attractive. It's good. It's a good word. Attractive is a good word. Now, <laughs> I'm not saying he's attractive. I'm saying the light is attractive. <laughs> that does about the same thing because I'm not getting enough. Oh, there we go. So if I tweak it and bend it, and a lot of times that's what you're doing. You're trying to figure out how to fit some light into a space so you can keep the frame you want but not... Um, not get in the shot because that's the rigging lighting, which we'll come to later, uh, is where it really starts to get practical, but also really tough because you're you're constricted by the reality of the space you're in, where you decide to take the shot from. Okay, um, that's those are the things that I had on the list. So, questions, comments, uh, we can keep playing with. Um, uh, other lights and other stuff that I brought in? Well, um, also maybe what we could do is each of you come up with one uh, lighting question that you have from your own documentary project, something that you're wondering about in terms of how you, know, how you could light either the interview or let's say some of you have some footage that you're shooting on location. Um, it should just kind of pop out to you what it is that's in your project that you, if you could ask a lighting guy, you know, you, now it's your opportunity, I guess. Um, so maybe they want to think about that for yeah, a minute. Yeah, take a minute. Let me and, grab this. Um, I'll take it from you. And then while you're thinking about it, maybe they, they could come up and you could, like, maybe two at a time, take a look at the, at the lights and, you know, how they... I don't know. Sometimes ha when you actually touching handle, feeling, yeah, yes. handle the barn doors, etc., um, that that makes them feel more like they understand a little bit more. Hands on. Come on, so, I'm. Y'all yeah, can all pile in. It's just start, fine. And once you get up there too, you know, if you want to ask about your documentary project, um, go ahead. You want to go first? Well, actually, I had a question. Uh -huh. for, go for it. For both of you, really. But so, can we film our interview like on location? Like we want, if we want to film like outside, like at a park, could we do our interview there? Absolutely, okay. anywhere that you want. Okay. It, this so, is completely open as long as you schedule it. Yeah. So if we were gonna do that, how would you suggest kind of manipulating the light outside? If Good. It was, yeah. Good question. Okay. Um, yeah, because the sun is your friend and your enemy simultaneously. Okay. Um, a basic rule of thumb. It's just some simple basics for doing an outside thing. Most of us tend to just have the person stand and if the sun's over there, here, Tom, stand like that, and then the light's right on them, right? Well, that's very flat, very hard on their eyes because we all know how bright the sun is, right? And then everything behind them is lit exactly the same as they are. And that doesn't separate them from their background, which is one of the goals of lighting. So if you can think of, we're just going to say, this is the sun, okay? Uh, and if I'm your subject, and you want to frame me just like this, right? And we're in a park, we'll assume. Uh, what time of day 
So this is the question you have to ask. What time of day do I want to be there to get the sun where I want it to be? Okay, so in a, in a, in a location scout, I will go out onto location with uh, the director, the producer, whoever else has drugged me out there for whatever reason, right? Cause, and, we're, and we'll be going to 15 places if we're doing a spot, let's say. Uh, okay, we're going to have uh, um, somebody running along this pathway early morning. Let's say we know it's early morning. Great. Which way do we want to film this? Looking that way, looking this way, etc. So I try and get the sunlight behind or off the off the shoulder this way. Okay. Couple reasons. One, I can now, as long as it's not really low in the sky, I can keep it out of the frame, okay? And everything that's behind them, if I pick my angle real closely, like if I find a wooded spot that's back there, that wooded spot's going to be a little darker because the light's going to be hitting those trees from behind just like it's hitting them from behind. So now that's dark. So now our talent is the brightest thing in the scene, okay? It's got nice separation light on them, okay, which is a, helps us, brings our eye to them. And that's kind of what I can get the sun to do for me. Now, what other things can I do? Um, I can get a nice bounce card like this. And if I put the bounce card out here, right, it's bouncing all that sunlight that's coming over their shoulder back at their face. Ah, so now the sun is two lights. It's my shoulder light. And because I'm using a bounce card, it's my key, my key okay? Set my exposure here, try and pick a background that's darker than they are. Not a big green grassy field with full sunlight, uh, if you can avoid it. Um, maybe there's a little patch of woods and there's a, a building over there, but it's brick. And because we're looking at the side of the building that's in the shadow, great, how awesome is that? So that's darker. So things, you know, so if you walk out there and think about where the sun will be at that time of day when you want to be there. There's a great app called Sun, Sun Seeker, Sun Finder. Hold on. Um. <laughs> Sun Position. S-U-N-P-O-N. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure all of you are infinitely more app friendly than I am. I can vaguely use it, uh, but it tells me where the sun is. And it's really cool because it overlays on my phone. It's like, we're going to be here at 630? Uh, on what day? Uh huh. The sun's gonna be there, right? So I can. I know. Nah, we want to do the shot at 7:30. Sun's gonna be too low. We have too many long shadows, as an example. Let's let it get up for an hour. It'll be in a better position, etc. So there's a lot. And and sometimes long shadows are awesome, particularly with young women running down a pathway in the morning. And then we'll get out there with some smoke, and we'll blow up a bunch of smoke so that the sunlight coming through the smoke is really neat and cool, right? And then you have them running. Wow, that was a quick setup. It only took the camera department 45 minutes to roll in, put the camera up, cue the talent. Sun was in the right position. I had my effects department there an hour earlier because they had to set up and blow all the smoke. Uh, the grip department was there an hour earlier, blah, blah, blah. So you you're planning and staggering your day. That's a huge part of my job is to make make my production money as so but to answer your question without going too far try and keep the sun over their shoulder directly behind them gets hard but just off of a shoulder and a lot of times that gives you a better monkey in to figure out what your camera position is you know 10 degrees here 10 degrees there sort of so thing where would the camera be um, you know how far from the subject I mean, that's a whole nother lecture yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for him in this particular um, instance, what would be like a um, I like using, okay, so we'll take a couple seconds. Are they going to be using these little cameras? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's another great app. Go to Able Cine Tech, and they have a uh, online app. I don't know if they've made it into a thing for your phone that compares different imager sizes to, uh, f to lens sizes. This is real inside baseball. But... Um, in an ideal world, the perfect portraiture lens for a camera like Pierre's using is 85 millimeter. Okay, that's 
with a with a full frame sensor exactly. Uh, so that sensor is probably a third inch, so it's one eighth the size of that sensor, and it would the lens will be proportionally smaller uh, to match that. And what that's about is um, um, the proportions of the human face. Okay. Uh, have you ever looked at something and people's faces look really exaggerated and the camera's like right up in their face and they, their face seems fatter than it should be? And a lot of times you'll see that in a comedy or uh, something where they're really trying to uh, do something exaggerated, right? To take you out of the norm. Our normal visual perspective is 50 millimeters. In other words, what, what's a normal normal lens? And then portraiture it's about 75 to 85 is kind of what how people describe it. Different, very good photographers will argue over whether they like a 65 lens better than a 105, normal, 85. So if you can jump on that Able Cine Tech app, you will find out 85 on that camera or on a full frame video camera equates to uh, you know, does this act, sorry, I'm actually going walking out of frame. Yeah, you don't have a way of saying what the frame is. Hold on, let's see. Oh, it's a 20 optical zoom, 6.4, 29 millimeters wide. So, okay. Um, you'd want to zoom in probably about two thirds of the way on that. Just as guess, if I had to make a guess on what that lens can do, I would say you'd go about two thirds of the way in, and then the proportions of the face are going to look the most natural, unless you want them to look wacky, and then that's cool and play around with it. But you're making a documentary, right? Is that what I heard? Okay. So if you're making a documentary, you're probably not trying to sway the audience's perception too much, like you might in a film or in a comedy, etc. Okay, next. Okay. Any other questions or you want to um, just you know, come up and take a Basically look? Basically answered my question. Did I? Okay, yeah. Are you all thinking of shooting outside? Is that where most people are thinking inside? Well, mine's going to be on like a basketball court. Okay. You came in a little bit later, right? Yeah, so you didn't hear me talking about the football stadium. No. So the challenge you'll have on the basketball court is what kind of, if do you want it to feel like it's during a game? Yeah. Okay, so you're going to get them to turn on the overhead lights? Mm -hmm. Okay, so get them to turn the overhead lights on and look at that light and see. I bet you it's going to be bl real blue, real daylighty. Okay, so none of these tungsten fixtures will actually help you. This little guy right here with uh, the daylight bulbs in it would, would be a useful tool. Because what you can't really do is mix. Okay, let me say this a different way. You ha if you're going to mix color temperatures, you need to know what you're doing. That's a better way of saying it. Okay, um, and and you will make your pictures look unnatural quickly by having a lot of mixed color temperatures. Things will start to go. Well, why is that this and that? You know, the person will look blue, and you won't know why, or they'll look way too orange, and you won't. And you know, you're trying to figure out why that is. Okay, so if you can keep the color temperature light consistent in the scene. That's ideal. So for you on the basketball court, you get those overhead lights on, and you use tools like these, bounce cards, solves all your problems because you're using that overhead light and bouncing it back. And if you hit white balance, it's going to look great. Okay? You can experiment, take the camera in with the lights on, and see if 56K or 32K looks better. Do a test, literally do, walk in and do, this is part of what I do on location scouts, I literally will take pictures and test. Uh, do I want to go daylight? Do I want to do, what, how do I want to do this, right? And how little work can I employ to get to the way I want it to look, okay? So for you, walk in, you need to do it with your cell phone. Your ca everyone's camera here, if you take it out of auto mode and you just tell it you want to take a daylight picture, or an indoor picture, right? You know, usually it's the little house with the light bulb on it or something like that. That those two icons on any of these small cameras means daylight or in you know, tungsten light. That's what they're comparing. So does that help you? Yeah. So do a test, shoot it maybe on both, 
and then do a white balance in there too. The cameras. They are white balance. Yeah. Oh. But we can do it manually. Okay. I, I tend to leave it on auto just so we don't have a lot of mistakes. But now after your. Yeah. Okay. So I will ex I will express my very old school opinion. Um, and, and no, it's absolutely true. Yeah. So, um, and this really falls into the worlds of cameras. Okay, it's a different thing because the the point of comparing cameras to lights is right here: color temperature, 32K, 56K. And it started in film. They had film stocks that were daylight. Then they made film stocks that were tungsten, and you picked. Okay, you guys know this? Yeah. And that's about it. And so the, we still work in that world, uh, although white balance is a way of accommodating that because the cameras can do it. Uh, so I would mitigating, uh, mitigating, so mitigating, mean, yeah. mitigating. Uh, I would always run the camera on either daylight or uh, inside tungsten, right? Or learn how to manually white balance it. I think I think that's worth your time in we'll in school to spend five minutes. Google the manual; it will tell you how to do it. It's not rocket science. Um, and uh, this does mean you have to pay attention whenever you are moving your location. Yeah. And there and there are times where you just look. There are plenty of times where I just walk on docks where I'll walk from room to room to room to room, and it's like walk in, white balance, start shooting. <laughs> Go to the next room, walk in, white balance, start shooting. Don't, I don't have time to do stuff. Uh, but then when I sit down to do the interview, you know, I throw all that out and I sit and do what I'm talking about here, okay? And figure out how do I want it to be. Because that's a way to make evocative, compelling, interesting images. Um, so, any other questions? And this is really how, this is how you, um, Tell the, um, I was going to say the men from the boys, but we can't say no, that No, you can't anymore. say that. No. <laughs> but this is how you really up your game. Yeah, that's a fair way of saying it. Yeah, understanding, um, understanding all the technique and all the craft that's out there and that's been around for a long time will help you elevate. And you're at a point where you're learning. Now's a great time to experiment. Because what's the worst thing that's going to happen? You're going to get a B minus instead of an A minus, right? And it's going to be, well, you know, you should have color balanced the camera. Da, da, da. It's like, yeah, but I was trying. If you can, fi <coughs> if you can figure out a creative way of selling your mistake, yeah. okay, then you can go work in an ad agency. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you won't have I to work in television. That. <laughs> That's right. No, no, it was our plan. And sometimes you find some really cool things by making a mistake. You're like, ah. Oh, Huh, this is interesting. I might use this later in some other thing, right? Because you know, you bump up against the edges of what you consider acceptable visually, and that's that's interesting stuff. Um, uh, so, yeah, I encourage you to make mistakes. Uh, I mentioned American Cinematographer Magazine. They have an online version of it. I think that you can take a look at for free. The, one of the articles, routine articles they have that I like best is a one-page interview at the end with a famous cinematographer. They always ask the question, what's your most memorable blunder? In other words, what big mistake did you make that you learned from? And they always have a great story about what they screwed up. And it's usually at some early point in the career. And, you, you know, you can't make this stuff up. This stuff happens to people, right? And, uh, and, it's, and it's interesting, and it demonstrates the importance of being willing to take risks, to make a mistake, to be honest about it, you know, to recover and figure out how to carry that forward. And hopefully you can do that in a way that doesn't cost a production company you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? That has happened, um, and, uh, but not often. And, uh, and this, is, this environment or in college or with your friends doing videos or whatever, a great place to experiment and play with the camera, with the lights, etc.